I'll uh, be running through the PV values and Dinny will actually explain the um, system for anyone that hasn't um, been involved with the um, PV value evaluation and analysis. Um, so I'm not going to run too much through the seasons, it was quite variable throughout the state for canola um, and with the limited data set we've really got to analyse uh, each site on an individual basis. Um, so firstly just want to run through a couple of the new lines. Uh, starting with Pioneers 44Y26, um, it's a bit of a niche line uh, when you compare it to Y24. Y24 is very versatile and it's adaptable across a lot of areas. So um, you've really got to use it for its particular traits. Uh, flowers a little bit later than 24, so you could potentially use it to get out of um, sclerotinia issues, but in terms of the yield data so far, it's, um, it really is a, a niche line. 45Y25 uh, is uh, a very good line for high rainfall, um, 450 plus. 44Y89, uh, it's an IT with a little bit of uh, limited information just because of the number of sites we have, but uh, so far looks to be fitting more north of the Greyson Highway. Uh, from Bayer IH51, which has got the uh, new podguard technology, so its, um, its yields are relatively sort of mid mainstream, midfield, um, but in terms of its agronomy trait, it needs to be looked on in terms of um, machinery constraints and whether you need to have a varied window for swathing parameters or at least only extending for a bit longer and need that tolerance. So that's, that's a variety that needs uh, evaluating on its individual merit. IH52 is a line that's um, replacing IH50. So, so far it looks like a fairly good replacement where the growers are happy with IH50. Uh, DG550 is Dynagro, so it's a uh, midfield probably like to see another season from it. Hyola 600, uh, so this line is a very long season line and needs, needs a full season to reach its full potential. If it shuts off, uh, we'll be punished a little bit. Uh, a particular trait that it has is it's um, quite vigorous and has very good rates of recovery. Uh, the Antiabasite this year had um, quite a bit of sandblasts and it was noted to be one of the uh, better performing varieties in terms of recovery. At that particular site, it was the highest yielding um, variety, but on top of that, we had late finishing rains, so it tended to favour the long season varieties. And the Hyola 725RT is obviously a very long season uh, variety, high rainfall south coast line, but again, going for that particular line for its um, agronomic character, using the triazine to get additional control, where we can try and sow it as a, uh, a mid April sowing window. I'll just hand you over to Dinny, who will explain. Hey, Vay. Um, my name is Dinny. I work for the SAGI project, which is a GRDC funded project that deals with statistics for the Australian grains industry. And one of the main projects we work on is the National Variety Trials. So I'm here to describe the new methodology that Blakely and Peter just went through in their talks for barley and wheat, respectively. But um, so I'll just go through again, as there are a few new faces in the room. Um, up till now, variety performance values are usually averaged on a regional basis for an egg zone, in the case of Western Australia. And the issue with this singular value is that it hides the effect of environment, environment impact on the actual variety performance. Production value is a rehash of this entire methodology. And production value plus is a system that we will be talking about as a new method of results presentation. So essentially, production value plus produces production values. It's a fancy word for grain yield in tonnes per hectare for every single variety at every single NVT site. So that's a NVT year and site combination. Some basic definitions. Um, variety PVs are essentially positive and negative deviations or differences relative to a baseline for each site. This baseline, which is reflected by the value PV0, indicates the expected average yield if we were to grow all the varieties in the canola NVT at that particular site. So for example, we've got Catani here, and you've got the 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014 growing seasons where we had this trial. And the x-axis also includes the trial mean yield, which is indicative of the type of year that was experienced for those particular trials. And on the y-axis, you've got your production values. 
So the key point is that your benchmark is a PV0, which is at that point, and your variety production values are reflective of that benchmark. So for example, Hyola 500 has a production value of 0 0.09 tonnes per hectare. That's better than the trial average, which is this PV0. Similarly, the benefit of production value plus that Blakely and Peter pointed out was that it also indicates variety stability over time and also niche performances of varieties at a particular growing season. So in 2013, Pioneer 45Y25 did exemplary. It was king of the pack. So while NVT gives you this information, it's, it's up to agronomists to actually chase up trial service providers as well as other agronomists to find out what is the actual driver between this variety performance. And PV Plus enables you that information to actually drill down into understanding why the environment particularly drove that particular performance for that niche growing season. Um, now I'll hand over to Matt. Cheers. So I've also included some tables just to, um, it gets very cluttered with the PV trying to look at some of the other entries uh, in the program. So um, looking at the UIT, it's uh, the whole list there are actually uh, quite good varieties. In the sense, you look at 45Y86, it uh, only in the 13 14 season, it was the um, variety with the largest area grown by growers. So it's, it was still a good variety only two years ago. So the lines obviously turn over very quickly. Um, but this, this group is um, quite tight in the data set. Um, there's a limited number of sites for IT, uh, given the volume that's actually grown in the state. Uh, it's quite a small portion relative to TT and Roundup Ready. Uh, so on the right hand side, you've got the number of sites where it's evaluated, and obviously um, the entries can be selected on where they perceive the variety is going to be performing well. So for example, um, 474 Hyola is, uh, is a good line for low rainfall. So this goes in uh, direct competition with uh, 44Y89. So if you look at Ag Zone 5 there, the area that it's actually um, particularly designed for, um, 44Y89 has actually performed quite well. But on an average across all those sites, it was down the bottom of that particular group. For that reason, I'd probably like to see another year from 44Y89, uh, given it's a new entry. Uh, looking at the top three, which will break down in PV value. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, the top four lines, 44Y87, 45Y88, which is at the same maturity as 86. Uh, the uh, area that I'd be just um, looking at in terms of Y88, in terms of 86, is it slightly back in terms of oil. So just uh, take that into account when you're uh, managing your nitrogen inputs. may have to come forward a little bit, uh, depending on yield potential. Hoyle 577 and Archer. So they're the top four and have been bouncing around the area for the last three years. Obviously canola turns over pretty quick so we can't push back the data set all that long. Um, looking at these values, Archer, you can just notice how it bounces from top to bottom um, regularly. It's, it's in terms of this group probably the weakest in terms of black leg. Uh, so it's one element you've got to take into consideration and it um, is quite season sensitive, so it needs a long, longer growing season. So if you look at um, Catanin in 2012, it was a, a little bit shorter, a little bit tougher finish, and Archer just didn't like it, so it obviously shuts off. Um, so stability-wise, you look at um, 87, 88, and 577, they're all stable performers above site average um, in those high, medium to high rainfall zones. Roundup ready. Now, um, the Roundup Ready group is a massive group, and we'll break this down again further. Now, it was only three years ago that we had only 30% of the lines were available, uh, and 70% of the line numbers were to come out. Now, it's the other ratio around, so 70% of the lines are actually available. So in terms of growth within this group, we're sort of going to hit a bit of a stable line in terms of um, yield gains. So um, a number of years ago, 404 was a clear benchmark, um, beating most lines, and now statistically you'd probably run from IH30 up to the top, um, and you'd have to nitpick between those varieties and put them in the particular areas that, um, that they fit in terms of their maturity groups. 44Y24, uh, um, 
GD50, high all the 404. They're lines that are extremely flexible, um, so they can go all the way, um, low rainfall, high rainfall. And this is, if you look on the far right, the number of sites, they're growing across a, a wide range of sites and still perform quite well on, on the averages. Uh, you also notice that in the actual tables uh, for each ag zone, there aren't too many ones. That's because the numbered lines aren't included and they're all rated including the, um, the numbered lines that are yet to be released. Uh, so a couple of the new lines um, that I mentioned earlier, Hyola 600, so good performer ag zone uh, 2 and 3. Uh, ag zone 6, obviously um, I mentioned before about its maturity length, it needs length and it was sown late at South Stirlings, so it got punished relative to other lines. But um, at that particular site, 5 series like 4, 5, white 25 and high oil 500 were actually very good performers. So they're showing a little bit more flexibility than high oil 600, which just concludes the fact that you've, you've really got to get it in early and April sowing really is probably is preferred time. But it's one year's data, so we've probably, we probably can't conclude too much from it. Um, DG 550, as I mentioned, in midfield. Um, and then the other particular lines that have got to be used for their agronomic traits. So breaking it down, obviously the PV value is zero at the bottom. So we really are nitpicking between these varieties and statistically in terms of yield, they're on all equivalents. They're all top performing lines and you can barely pull a difference between them. Um, in terms of oils, high oil of 600 is probably the new benchmark according to last year's data. Um, and then you move down to Hyola uh, 500 and then um, Pioneer's Y25 onto 24 and 24's on equal field to GD50. So Y24 and GD50 as I mentioned before are extremely stable producers whether it's high rainfall or low rainfall and you can just see this from 2012 they're uh, in the uh, greenish colour and the red and they basically just follow each other and bounce around each other and this is high rainfall and low rainfall. So the early series, so the quicker lines we split down to Hyola 404, um, IH30, Y23, I've included 50 and 24 just to show how they, they compare. So again they still bounce around the main field Obviously those niche lines that are a little bit quicker in maturity have been able to capitalise on a, on a harsher finish. Um, but statistically, if, if you run um, uh, the, the difference, there isn't a, a great deal of difference between this group. Um, for simplicity, this top five group has been entered in. Last year in 2014's data, GG41 uh, peaked right up and was back up with the top group. Uh, in terms of PV value, it drops off because it had, it had one bad season and brought down its averages. So um, this is where we got a bit of bounce with that variety. On to TT lines. So obviously there's uh, quite a dominance in uh, Hyolas, which are hybrids uh, from PAX. Um, this is really what you want to see if you're going to be paying the extra dollars for um, hybrid cost. Uh, but some of these varieties have had limited testing. As you can tell on the far right, 725 is only in two sites, so you can't actually give that too much credibility to be sitting at the second top. In saying that, um, 525 and 559, so these were two lines that were supposed to be quite similar, um, but 525 obviously has got that um, Roundup gene in it, so we can use both chemistries for that agronomy trait. And uh, in 2014, it lifted and was basically comparable in terms of yield, which is what we wanted to see. 2013 wasn't quite the situation due to um, uh, certain seed conditions. It was from a summer program and uh, it was indicated that the seed source was an issue. Um, Wahoo was uh, probably the most solid performing line, OP, for high rainfall areas. And Benito on an average jumped above Stingray and relative to 2013 they basically bounce around each other. Um, but we'll break this down further. So just uh, on the TTRT, it's, it still is a trait that you're going for that additional level of control. So if, if you're going to be sowing early like you would on uh, Hyola 725, um, that atrazine obviously can put out later and get that additional residue control on your ryegrass. At the moment it's not a clear 
um, winner over anything else in the TT chemistry group. So it is purely an agronomy trade. You look at 2013, um, 5.25 was quite a bit lower than 5.59, but 2014 data, so the varieties are ranked on how they performed in 2014. Uh, 5.25 performed extremely well. Now if we were to run this through PV um, analysis, the 5.25 on an average would still be below 5.59, but we've got to take those um, additional bits of information from whether it be the seed supplier and make a, a judgment call on whether you perceive it's, um, it's going to be good or not. And from all the data points that we had in 2014, it looks just as good as 559. So this is obviously the um, old school way of looking at it. Uh, CVs are both credible at Canada, up, good sites. Um, and you look at the stats and Wahoo wasn't too different to the, uh, to the hybrids up there. So this is just um, back to the PVs and I just wanted to break up uh, the difference between um, the hybrids and the OPs. So we've got Benito and Stingray and 450 and 559 which are, are two benchmarks within uh, each category. So uh, analysing this, you look at 450 and 559 and they're stable, they're pretty much flat lined, they're always producing above side average and they're quite stable producers. Whereas you look at Benito and Stingray and there's quite a lot of bounce. Some instances, you know, they're actually better performing than these hybrids and other examples, they're well below. And the, and the reason for this is, as um, previous presenters have mentioned, you've got to know uh, each site and what was happening to that site, whether it's waterlogging, disease, uh, those type of things that are going to affect um, each variety. So, um, you look at Catani there, where the two um, OPs bounced down in 2013. There was very, very minor um, waterlogging stress, so the hybrids actually had better capacity to recover under this situation. And you look at Munglin up in 2013, so it didn't even go a ton, but this was under extreme um, waterlogging conditions and it bounced just as much. So um, this is in terms of your analysis, you've got to take this into account and assess where these varieties can go on a paddock by paddock basis because on an average, yet they look good in those 1.5 tonne plus environments. And then in certain situations where you may have a, a tendency to get waterlogging, they um, can recover better and you yield gain. It may not be a high yield, but the benefit difference is greater. So it's got to be evaluated um, on a paddock by paddock basis. And then when we move into the um, low rainfall area, um, these stresses become less, so there's less black leg pressure, there's less water logging, and they basically dance around each other. Um, 2013 in Scadden, there was a little bit of black leg, so uh, Benito dropped down a little bit, but it wasn't, um, wasn't a huge amount. There may have been some other factors, but um, its black leg is just as good as the others, slightly less than two hybrids. Um, Hyden, it's much of a muchness, so OP still definitely have, have their um, place um, in the wheat belt and surrounds. So conclusion, um, there's, a, there's a huge range of varieties to choose from. Um, we've got to, we've got to um, choose them on their individual merit and um, the Roundup Ready group is about to stabilise in terms of its um, growth because most of the um, good varieties are are released, not to say there isn't going to be development because 30% of the lines uh, are coded to be released. Um, and coming down to understanding the phenology of, of your different varieties to manage them, like, like um, Bayer's IH51, you know, it's, it's got the pod guard, which will be a great trait that you can use for different management practices um, and different flowering patterns to avoid sclerotinia in, in the north and certain areas. Um, black leg is, is becoming a little bit more of an issue in the south. Um, there's monitoring sites, there's eight monitoring sites across WA and they're starting to indicate in the southwest that there's uh, moderate levels coming into the um, group B genetic resistance, uh, slight levels for group A in Katani. Um, so all, all of those background genetics we need a cross reference with the different groups in the varieties and uh, make a judgement call from there depending on history. So thanks to all the grower groups, um, cooperators, Calix staff, Dinny for doing up all the PV slides, GRDC and ACAS. Uh,